And so listen, who grew up in a family where mom had the rule, no jumping on the bed, no jumping on the furniture? Who had that kind of rule? Come on, we had that rule. We had that rule growing up, right? No jumping on the furniture. But guess what? My mom was in the last service. She's not here at this service. Oh, yeah. Welcome to the Comfy Couch new series at Church by the Glade. Gonna be fun today. I do no tricks on the trampolines. I might hurt myself. And we're gonna have a great time. And we are pro couch because couches are just cool. Uh, we have a couch in our family room. And man, we have great times there. I love being on the family couch, talking to my teenagers about their day, hanging out with my wife. Uh, my seven-year-old, we curl up in the corner of the couch almost every night. That's our thing we do. Watch a little TV, his shows, The Thunderman, Henry Danger, something spiritual like The Simpsons. I love me the couch. Hello, Bezel T3. That's the kind of shenanigans you're going to see when you visit Church by the Glades in Coral Springs, Florida. Their church website states that Church by the Glades is fearlessly led by Pastor David Hughes. We are about two things, Jesus and his word. Church by the Glades is a hyper-creative and a fully charged church where no perfect people are allowed. And if you go under the What We Believe tab, we find this. Though possessing the ultimate truth, the church is often guilty of dumbing down or dulling down the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Lost in confusing jargon, bogged down in doctrinal minutia, simply said, the church has not stayed current. Though not perfect, we seek to be authentic. Now, two things strike me here. One, you will not find much of Jesus in the sermon we're about to look at. And two, though certainly not dulled down, Church by the Glades is truly guilty of dumbing down the message of Jesus Christ. Now, I stumbled upon uh, Pastor Hughes jumping the couch on Pirate Radio's Museum of Idolatry website. You might want to check that out one day. Now, jumping the couch is not a new idea. Have you ever felt this way? <laughs> but David seems to genuinely like couches. Here is his family photo on the church website. He recently began a series called Big Comfy Couch, and this is the first installment of this short series. David's text is going to be Judges chapter 3. Um, this series is about getting stuck. Getting stuck. I, you know, if you're in that point in life, there's no momentum, no progress, no growth. You have certain goals, but for some reason, you're just not getting those goals achieved in your life. You're a little bit stuck. You see, God wants us to grow. It's the doctrine of sanctification. Well, I'll be darned, the doctrine of sanctification. I didn't see that one coming. But doesn't that come under the confusing jargon category that keeps churches from staying current? <laughs> well, lest you be too concerned, David will never end up explaining what the word actually means. God wants us to grow, to mature, to get better. God has incredible goals. God has potential for you, for you to find and fulfill. So this is your series to get yourself unstuck for God to revisit your life with purpose, power, and momentum. Purpose, power, and momentum? Potential to get better? <laughs> better at what? I thought sanctification was all about having a new heart and a new spirit created by the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit through the power of Christ's death and resurrection. That the believer is now set apart and declared holy and progressively being made holy through the grace of the Holy Spirit that the dominion of sin is toppled over and the desires of the old Adam are more and more weakened. And at the same time, the ability to practice true holiness is brought to life and strengthened more and more by hearing God's word through the preaching that you would hear every Sunday and the power of the Spirit working through that preaching and the sacraments, by the way. Oh, but that's right. All that is too dull to spend time explaining. But again, as I deal with this series about getting too comfortable, there is a proper place for rest. You stay in Judges, look what the king said, what Jesus said in Matthew. He said, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn, this is so good. 
Learn the unforced rhythms, come on, unforced rhythms of grace. Okay, the Message Bible, which is neither a translation of the original Greek by any stretch, or even really a good paraphrase, like the Living Bible, Read Matthew 11, 28 and 29 in a decent literal translation like the New American Standard or the English Standard Version, and you'll think you're reading an entirely different passage. See, to me, the message seems to contain what the author would like the Bible to say. But it does come in handy for David here because it uses the word rhythm. And this will become very important, as you will see. He's now going to describe the rhythm of a rut. Wake up, go to work. This is your rhythm. This is your rhythm, right? Rhythm of a rut. Wake up, go to work, drive home, hit the couch. So at least now we have a paper-thin veneer of an excuse for that gigantic couch being on the stage. See, God wants to enter, energize your life with vision, vitality, make your everyday matter, make it count, make you wake up on Monday excited, charge into your week, knowing you're a person of divine destiny. He wants to get you unstuck. If you're in a rut, if your rhythm is a rut, if you're just kind of mundane and dull on board, God brought you here to get you unstuck today. And this is your new day, your new year, your new life. Okay, I'm ready, David. I want vision and vitality and to know my divine destiny. What do you got for me? Well, David is going to try and deliver those things by going to Judges chapter 3. So uh, we'll start in verse 12. Verse 12, verse 12. So this whole thing just happened. They turn from God and, and they, 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 get, they get in trouble and they're in bondage and they cry out to God. God sends a hero, deliverer. And, and so it happens now we get to verse 12. It begins like this. One, two, three. Once again, it's a cycle. It's a rhythm, a ruinous rhythm. Now, David's right that the rhythm of Judges is this, apostasy, judgment by God through the pagan nations that the Israelites wanted to inter intermingle with, repentance because of their sin and idolatry, and then repeat the cycle th throughout the whole book. A recurring theme we hear over and over again is the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. And the book ends with this. It's very sad. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And we see this cycle two times in chapter 3 alone. First, God raises up Othniel, and Israel has peace for 40 years. He dies. Israel apostatizes again. They're led into bondage to serve the king of Moab for now 18 years. They finally cry out to God, and God raises up a left-handed nobody named Ehud, who visits the king, bringing him a tribute of grain. The, the, the Moabites liked to eat a lot. That's why they were all fat. Uh, but with a hidden agenda and a hidden weapon to be used to assassinate him. Verse 22 is for the dudes, for the brothers. Here we go. The dagger went so deep that the handle disappeared beneath the king's fat. So Ehud did not pull out the dagger. Like, you just keep it now. And to make it even more gross, and the king's bowels emptied. This is the inspired word of God right here. <laughs> David said, this is for the dudes. You'll like this, guys, because it's got violence and it. The story's super explicit and it's gross. Now, David is going to make a big deal of the end of chapter 3 because we're told that because Ehud changed the rhythm of his life, Israel had peace for 80 years. Well, big deal, as we're going to see. 10,000 Moabites die, and the people of God have peace and prosperity for 80 years. Wow, he changes the rhythm of his life. He changes the rhythm of his nation. They go from a rhythm that is a rut, from a rhythm that is ruinous, to a rhythm of righteousness. New day, new song. For somebody here who's stuck, let's change your rhythm. See, it would be a big deal if the book of Judges ended there in chapter 3. But that's not the story. The story goes on through the whole book of this apostasy and judgment and repentance. The cycle continues. Now, we can see this just at the beginning of chapter 4. Then the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. You see, is David really trying to use Ehud as an example of how to change the rhythm of your life? 
Now, remember what I said about using the Message Bible because it had the word rhythm in the passage. Well, here's why he did that. David now shifts from a dumbed-down exposition of Judges chapter 3 to a full-blown, fanciful, four-beat rhythm thing. Let me give you four new beats for God to restructure the rhythm of your life. Four beats. First one's this. First beat's this. Frustration. Frustration. Well, by the way, what happened to the doctrine of sanctification? It was mentioned, but of course, never explained. Now, if you're new to our church, it's not that kind of church. I mean, it's not negative and harsh. My goal is never to beat you up, but always to build you up. But some of y'all are a little too comfortable right now in your dysfunction. You're doing denial. So here's, here's my balance plan. If you're hurting and come to church by the glades, I want to comfort the afflicted. But also sometimes I want to afflict the comfortable and get you off the comfy couch of complacency because you're messed up and you're pretending like you're not. Let's fix the broken areas of your life. Relationships, habits, discipline. The preacher's job is to explain God's word through much study and prayer and reliance on the Holy Spirit. But here, David descends into therapist life coach mode who wants to use the Bible to fix the broken areas of your life. See, megachurches don't like using the biblical word sin much, so it becomes our brokenness or our mistakes or even our stupid. Now, I want you to guess which one of these broken areas Dave wants to talk about next. I'll give you a hint. It starts with an M. Listen, I know a lot of us are frustrated financially. In fact, let me survey the room. If you had at least one moment of financial frustration any time in 2016, at least one moment that you were <laughs> frustrated about money at all last year, raise your hand. At least one time. What a surprise. A multi-site megachurch pastor talking about money? Now, I wanted to do this sermon review because of a pastor jumping on a ridiculously ginormous couch. But what is his topic now? Money. But hold on, folks. It gets worse. That's why we offer this really practical, powerful, helpful course called Financial Peace University by Dave Ramsey. And we register people in January. No way. Not David Ramsey again? During a sermon? Again? Folks, I just did a video where David Ramsey actually usurped the preaching time at a mega church near me. I mean, this is incredible. Okay, Ehud and the book of Judges is a distant memory. And now David is going to waste precious preaching time using candy bars, full-size candy bars, I should say, to guilt the people in the audience to attend David Ramsey's Freedom Peace Money Seminar. This is so painful, folks. I'm going to speed it up a little bit in order to get through it faster. Overall, there are exceptions, but most of us, and we're an American church, there are 2,000 seats in this room, and I want to show you how we reflect typically the American economic practices, how we manage and we rightly mismanage money. And because it's a hard subject and a tense topic, I'm going to make this fun, you received a candy bar when you came in the room at all of our campuses. And Church by the Glades, we didn't give you like a snack size or a fun size, we gave you a full-size candy bar in Jesus' name. Let me kind of go through this. These represent where people stand financially in America and sadly in my church. Um, number one, if you received a payday candy bar at of our campuses, I want you to stand up right now. Stand up right now and be proud. Who got a payday? Now, if you received a hundred grand bar, stand to your feet, stand to your feet. Give it over the hundred granders. If you received a zero bar, stand to your feet, zero people. The bottom 2% of America are represented by the milk duds, the milk duds, a Nestle's crunch. Stand up, crunch people. Stand up, crunch people. Oh yeah, make some noise. Make some, please pan the cameras around. This is so fun. Look at, look at all the people. Like Stand up, come on. You are feeling the financial crunch every day and every week of your life. If you're in that 88%, you know, 88%, not, not the top, the top, no, 80, but the 88%, um, you need to take financial peace. I mean, talk about dumbing down a sermon. Oh wait, this, really this isn't a sermon anymore. It's an advertisement. There's financial dysfunction in your life. Oh, that was really sucky applause if you're watching online. That's too late, too late, too late, too late. I don't want you to clap. I want you to leave the service and register today. If you missed my video about feeding the mega church beast, go to my channel and look that one up. David is in full beast feeding mode right now. Well, David, I heard it costs $100. It does. They charge us $100. We don't upcharge you at all. $100. And we provide childcare during the weekends. And so I just want you to get healthy here. 
And by the way, if you think that's too much and you're like a single parent and you have custody of your kids, you can't afford $100, I will scholarship all single parents who are taking care of their kids. Wait, wait, the one time I'm a legalist. Now David has the audacity to actually attach a condition to his otherwise gracious scholarship offer. You pay the $100 and register today and when you finish all nine weeks, I'll give you your money back. You probably won't need it, but I'll give it back to you. You probably won't need it? Oh, is that because in nine short weeks, Christian money guru David Ramsey will turn your financial life around so fast that you, single parent with kids at home, won't need that money anymore? Right. Now, are you ready? Here he comes with the three remaining beats. Okay, I need three more beats quickly. Frustration, frustration, fixation. Well, if that is you, let's change your focus. Let's change your fixation. It says in Hebrews chapter 12, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Now, Jesus finally gets honorable mention in this sermon, but it appears he does so only because David needed another F word from the Bible. The writer of Hebrews does indeed say that we're to fix our eyes on Jesus. But what is it about Jesus that makes him the author and the finisher of our faith? Well, David doesn't explain that. Sadly, David seems totally uninterested in the Jesus who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. This passage in Hebrews about fixing our eyes on Jesus becomes nothing more than a toss-away line used only for rhythm's sake. David would rather talk about God-sized dreams and goals for your life. You see, let's get you a worthy goal in 2017. Your goals are too small and too selfish. God has these God-sized dreams and, and goals and purpose for your life. And how, how do you find those? Where do I find David? I, I wonder what God has planned for me, this customized plan that God has scripted for me from the beginning of time. Where do I find that? Okay, question. When Ehud, the hero, wanted to take out the hater, Eglon, God gave him a weapon. He had a weapon of choice. What was that weapon in this narrative he used? What was it? Hand grenade, bazooka, nunchuck skills. What, what was it? What, what was it? Yeah, not just any sword. It was a double, you guys listen so well. Thank you. A double-edged sword. I'm embarrassed. I've been reading this story since I was a middle school boy. I probably, that's why I like this story. It's gross. Middle school boy. And I noticed for the first time revving up for this teaching, that exact language, a double-edged sword, was his weapon of choice that same language shows up in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 4 as the Bible defines the Bible. It's on the verse, it's on the screen, the verse is on the screen, all campuses. It says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Is this why David chose this odd passage out of Judges to talk about couches and ruts and rhythms? Could it be that he did so in order that he could make a crazy comparison between the two-edged dagger that Ehud used to kill King Eglon and the word of God? <laughs> and talk about missing the forest for the trees here. So I want you to dig in the word because you're going to find God's will for your life and God's win for your life as you're in God's word. God's will and God's win? As if the Bible is your personal treasure map to find your personal God-sized dreams? Preaching God's word and not his dumbed down ideas to everyone, not just the dudes, by the way, is what Pastor David should be doing and is not doing. So here's my challenge. I wanna challenge our church in 20, 2017. Show up. Be here every week, because we're gonna teach you the word of God. Why people would show up for this nonsense is beyond me. David has not preached Jesus Christ from all the scriptures. He's used a story from the inspired scriptures to talk about you. But David, the Bible is not about the Christian. It's for the Christian, but not about the Christian. David seems to have missed the words of Jesus after his resurrection from the dead in Luke 24. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets judges included. He interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. David will now add a third rhythm word 
and misuses Ehud as an example of someone who fights so that God will change his life. Frustration, fixation. We use the frustration as the catalyst to motivate me to get uncomfortable to fix my eyes on Jesus. Frustration, fixation, fights. Now, I'm not telling you to pick a fight in high school or be pugnacious or argumentative. I mean be courageous, intrepid, and resolved that you're going to fight the fight to see God change your life. David then begins blasting the law at the guys, which by itself will only condemn you. He blasts the guys in the audience as the recipe for changing their lives. Here's just one example. I want you never to lie. You're not going to lie to your boss. You're not going to lie to your clients. You're not going to lie to your friends. You're not going to lie to your kids. And you're not going to lie to your wife, ever. You're not going to lie, ever, to your wife. Amen? That's not good news, folks. Imagine a guy in that audience who finds himself telling a lie the next week, or even the next day. Without the gospel that tells us that Jesus always told the truth and was crucified for all the times I didn't tell the truth or disobeyed any one of the other commandments, the only option I have is to try harder the next time and either fool myself that I'm pulling it off or finally give up the whole enterprise because no one can live up to the demands of the law. A fight always precedes new life. You want a new life, new day, new rhythm, labor, intense, fights. Say what? That is not Christianity. Someone fought and won for sure, but it wasn't you. It was Jesus. What David completely misses is seeing Jesus in the story of Ehud and Eglon. Just like Ehud, a left-handed, lying, deceiving assassin who couldn't be more unlikely of a savior of the people of Israel. Well, just as unlikely to human wisdom is that God himself would condescend and take on human flesh and display radical weakness from the cradle to the cross so that he might destroy our greatest enemy, that being sin, death, and the just judgment of God. You see, what precedes new life in the Bible is the Holy Spirit regenerating our hearts to understand and embrace by faith the good news of Jesus Christ. It's his perfect life and substitutionary death that gives us new life. Paul teaches this in Romans chapter 6. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. You see, that is the essence of Christianity and should be preached every Sunday from a Christian, well, an evangelical Christian pulpit. But this was largely ignored completely in this sermon. Frustration, new fixation, frustration, fixation, fight, freedom. Frustration, fixation, fight, and freedom. <laughs> this is not preaching, folks. Take away the big couch, the hip pastor lingo, the financial scolding, the law-keeping imperatives, and what have you got? a Christless Christianity, and a church that embraces world-centeredness rather than God-centeredness. And if you doubt that, take a gander at how the sermon ends. Rhythm. Hey, rhythm people, help me out. Rhythm people, help me out. I got some, bring out some of our musicians, right? Because what I don't have, they have. And what they don't have, I have. All right, help me. Lucas, Daryl, Lynn. All right, man. I need some rhythm people. I need we some rhythm you. people. Okay. Rhythm people. We're going to start off nice and simple. You ready? Here we go. All right. Frustration, fixation, fight, freedom. Oh, Frustration, good. fixation, fight, freedom. Frustration, fixation, fight, freedom. Give me some drums. Thank you.
three, two, one. 